We now know that an atom consists of a nucleus with electrons orbiting around it. Let's have a closer look at how those electrons are actually arranged. Observing that there were occasional large jumps in the energy required to remove successive electrons from an atom, Niels Bohr proposed the existence of electron shells. He said that when you give electrons energy, they can jump from one shell to the next shell, a little bit like climbing a ladder. Either you've got enough energy to go up one step or you haven't. You can't stop halfway between. When that energy was absorbed, it would move the electrons from a lower level to a higher energy level and when the energy was given off, as they dropped back to the lower level, this came off in the form of light. This theory worked pretty well for hydrogen, which only had one electron. But when you get to more complicated elements that have more electrons, such as mercury and neon, there were a lot more lines in the emission spectra. And this wasn't really very well explained by the theory of shells. There had to be something else going on. These problems are reinforced by looking at the ionization energy versus atomic number graph. You can see that as we move from lithium to neon, the amount of energy to remove one electron increases, which is what we would expect. However, there are some anomalies between nitrogen and oxygen and between beryllium and boron where there's an unexpected decrease. So again, this reinforces the idea that there must be something else going on other than just purely shells. There are a few other problems with Bohr's model. It doesn't explain why shells have a particular energy, nor does it explain why the orbits the electrons follow are circular and not elliptical like planets. It doesn't explain why we only put eight electrons in the third shell before we have to put two in the fourth shell, when we know that the third shell can actually take 18 electrons. So again, we need to do some modification. Another fly in the ointment was the work of Werner Heisenberg, who said that it was impossible to tell both the position and the angular momentum of an electron. This meant that you could find out where an electron was, but not where it was going to finish up. Or alternatively, you could find out what the energy an electron had, but not where it was at any point in time. In an attempt to explain these anomalies, in 1926, Erwin Schrödinger produced an equation that described the energy and position of the electrons in an atom. It didn't violate the uncertainty principle, and it described the electrons as being in orbitals. In this model, the electrons don't move around in a definite path like the planets around the Sun, but more in a defined region based on their energy. So this gives us the idea of an electron cloud with no sharp boundaries. Schrodinger used three quantum numbers to describe the electron's position in space. The first number described the size, the second described the shape, and the third number described the orientation of the orbitals in space. A fourth quantum number was used to describe the spin of the electrons, but that's more than we need to know for this course. The quantum model still proposes electrons in shells. In fact, the first quantum number is the same as the shell number. It also states that each shell can hold a maximum of two n squared electrons, where n is the shell number. But it also proposes several subgroupings within the shells, where the probability of finding an electron is greater. In a practical sense, the model says that we have a shell, and inside that shell there is a subshell. Inside the subshell there are orbitals, and inside the orbitals there are electrons. Around this time, another physicist showed that the orbitals that Schrödinger proposed could only contain 0, 1 or 2 electrons. This became known as the Pauli exclusion principle and it governed where the electrons could be found. Another physicist also proved that electrons would enter the lowest energy level first, which to us seems logical, but at the time mathematical proof was needed. Where the first quantum number describes the shells, and hence the size of the atom, the second describes the shape. The first of these is the S subshell, which is spherical. Each shell has an S subshell, and it can either hold one or two electrons. We designate it as 1S or 2S, depending on which shell we're talking about. The P subshell consists of three orbitals arranged along the X, Y and Z axis. They're shaped a little bit like a dumbbell and again they can hold up to two electrons. There are no P subshells in the first shell, they begin at the second shell. 
As the atoms get bigger and have more electrons, these are accommodated in the D subshell. You can see that D orbitals have quite different shapes from S and P orbitals. However, they can each hold up to two electrons, making a possible total of 10 electrons in a D subshell. The D subshells begin in the third shell. The F subshell begins in the fourth energy level. Because it has seven different orbitals, these orbitals can hold two electrons each. It can hold a maximum of 14 electrons. So to summarise, the first shell has one subshell, the second has two, the third has three, and the fourth has four. Within these subshells, the number of orbitals is fixed as one s orbital per shell, three p orbitals, five d orbitals, and seven f orbitals. Because each orbital can hold up to two electrons, this also controls the number of electrons in each subshell as two in the first, six, ten, and fourteen. And this is the same regardless of which shell it is. By applying our formula 2n squared, where n is the shell number, we can see that the first shell can hold two electrons, the second can hold eight, because two times two squared is equal to eight, the third has 18, and the fourth has 32, which still agrees with Bohr's predictions. The same pattern is repeated for the seventh shell and the sixth shell. So just recapping, the model says that we have electrons, inside orbitals, which are inside subshells, which are inside shells. Now you would think that each successive shell would be at a higher energy level than the previous one. However, if you look closely at this diagram, which shows the energy of each subshell, you can see that there are some overlaps between shells. For example, the 4s subshell has a lower energy than the 3d subshell. You remember that argon has 18 electrons, which we allocated as 288 as an electron configuration. However, when we got to potassium, which had 19 electrons, we had to put one electron into the fourth shell, making 2881, even though we knew that the third shell could take 18 electrons. This model now explains why that takes place. Because the 4s subshell has less energy than the 3d, then electrons have to go into 4s before 3d. Similarly, the 5s and 5p subshell have lower energy than the 4f, and hence they get filled first. This model now explains, and is an improvement on the Bohr model, as it tells us why we don't completely fill shells before adding electrons to the next shell. So how do we write the electronic configuration of an atom, now that we know that there are subshells within the shells? First of all, we write the shell number. So for helium, this is 1. Then we give the subshell, and then we state how many electrons are present in the subshell. So for boron, which has 4 electrons, we would place 2 electrons in the first shell and write it as 1s2. Then, since the first shell is full, we have to put the other two electrons in the lowest energy subshell of the second shell, which is the 2s subshell, and show that we have two electrons there. It's important to remember the filling order of the subshells, but we can use a simple diagram to make this easier. First list the subshells in each shell. 1s in the first, s and p in the second, sp and d in the third, and so on. The order in which they fill is shown by the arrows. You follow the arrow to the end, and then go back to the head of the next arrow. So, we go from 3s to 3p, and then 4s, and then back to the head of the next arrow, which is 3d, and so on. When we've added two electrons to the 7s subshell, which subshell fills next? If you answered 5f, then you would be correct. So when we're writing electronic configurations, there are three basic steps. First, we need to work out how many electrons there are. You can do this by looking up the atomic number on the periodic table. Then, we start adding electrons to the subshells, remembering the filling order. And we also need to remember the maximum number of electrons that each subshell can hold. Two in the S subshell, 
6 in the P subshell, 10 in the D, and 14 in the F subshell. So let's try a few examples. Remember the rules for filling say that we need to fill the lowest energy level first and that each orbital can only take a maximum of two electrons. You can see the filling order for reference at the top of this slide. So we're told that nitrogen has seven electrons. So we put the first two electrons in the S, 1S subshell and this fills the first shell completely. The next two electrons go into the next lowest energy level, which is the 2s, and we write that as 2s2. We have three more electrons to place, and since the next lowest subshell is the 2p subshell, which can hold six electrons, we can put the last three electrons there and write it as 2p3. In a similar way, sodium has 11 electrons, so two in the 1s subshell, two in the 2s, and six in the 2p. This leaves us with one extra electron to place, which goes into the 3s subshell and is written as 3s1. Chromium is a little bit more complicated, but we can follow the same pattern. We put 2 in 1s, we put 2 in 2s, and 6 in 2p. That is 10 electrons, and we have what, 14 left to go. The next lowest energy level, according to our diagram, is 3s and 3p. So we fill those. Now we have six electrons left to place. The next lowest level after 3p is 4s, so two electrons go in there, which leaves us with four more electrons to place, and these then go into the next subshell, which is the 3d subshell. You can see that the 4s is actually filled here before the 3d is actually attempted. What about arsenic with 33 electrons? We already know that we can place 18 electrons in the first three shells. Then we put two in the 4s subshell, leaving 13 to go. The diagram tells us that the 3d subshell is next and we know it can take 10 electrons. So in they go. This leaves us with three electrons left to place and they can go into the 4p subshell, which has the next lowest energy. We can follow this pattern to give the electronic configuration of any atom as long as we know how many electrons it has and as long as we follow the correct filling order. If we wrote out the complete electronic configuration for larger atoms, it would take a very long time, so chemists have developed shortcuts. Since we know that the noble gases are very stable with eight outer shell electrons, we can write the configurations using the core of the closest noble gas and just giving the detailed configuration of the outer shell. For example, the closest noble gas to sodium is neon, which has 10 electrons. So we can give the neon core written in square brackets and then just state the outer shell configuration as 3s1. Similarly, aluminium has 13 electrons, so we can account for 10 as the neon core and just give the rest of the configuration as 3s2, 3p1. For zinc, which has 30 electrons, the closest noble gas is argon, which has 18, leaving 12 to place. And these go into the next energy levels, giving us 18 from the argon core, plus 2 in the 4s and 10 in the 3d, making 30 electrons in total. We can repeat this pattern for all the other elements as well. So what is the relationship between the periodic table and the electron configurations? We can see here that the first two groups correspond to electrons being added to the S subshell. Group 1 has one electron in the S subshell. Group 2 has two S electrons. The block on the right hand side corresponds to electrons being placed in the P subshell. P1 right through to P6. The yellow block contains five d orbitals for each shell, and you can see clearly here why the 4s subshell fills before the 3d. The blue block corresponds to electrons being added to f orbitals, and this represents the lanthanide and actinide series. So we now can see why the periodic table looks the way it does. 
So now we have the complete story from the early days of water, earth, wind and fire to the modern quantum mechanical model of the atom which explains the modern periodic table. But don't think the story is finished there. There are pisons and mesons and quarks and spinning electrons and more is being added to our knowledge all the time. Who knows, by the time you finish this course a new theory may be on the horizon. But for now this theory explains most of what we need, so let's practice using it.